The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. It's an exciting day for the UC system and for me. My PhD is from UCLA, and it's a great pleasure to have uh, UC Santa Barbara doing math finance. So the interest in math finance continues to grow exponentially, pun intended, both domestically and abroad. Uh, mathematical finance, which I'll abbreviate to MF, already has various subdisciplines such as financial engineering, computational finance, and econophysics, which you could shorten to finance, P-H-Y-N-A-N-C-E. <laughs> and as these multi-part names suggest, and as Jean-Pierre has already alluded to, math finance is multidisciplinary, a rich broth of applied math, finance, engineering, physics, and computer science. And as a representative of both the industry from Bloomberg and from Academia NYU, I welcome the ongoing efforts here at US UCSB in math finance. So Casey Stengel has already been quoted once, I uh, will refer to him again. He once said, in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice, they're very different. <laughs> <laughs> and having spent 10 years as a practitioner and eight years as an academic, I have to agree with Casey. Go Mets. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> math finance is, is too important to be left solely to academics. There's, there's a thriving subculture of quants happily doing research trading and risk management in the banking, insurance, software, money management, and even the public sector. And my talk is going to address math finance from a practitioner's perspective. So accordingly, we'll dispense with frivolities such as clarity, logic, et cetera. <laughs> so um, I want to give you an overview of my talk today, uh, give a brief history of math finance, talk about some prominent mathematicians contributing to math finance, and also some prominent finance academics. I'll talk about the math used in math finance as well as the finance. I'll talk about other educational programs in math finance and books for mathematicians and physicists in case any of you have an interest in learning math finance. I'll talk about academic and industry conferences, the ones that I feel are important to attend, about applications of math finance to industry. I'll spend a lot of time on that. I'll talk about active research areas in math finance, such as stochastic volatility, and open problems in the math finance field. So the history of finance is, is long and varied, but most people would place the beginning uh, with Bachelier, in, who in 1900 published his dissertation, Theory of Speculation. He was a student of Henri Poincaré, and unfortunately, his dissertation was not recognized for the um, immense contribution that we now see that it had. He founded uh, the theory of Brownian motion, which is a widely used stochastic process in the field of finance. And uh, unfortunately, uh, his uh, advisor thought, and, and he applied Brownian motion to the pricing of options on the Paris Bourse. His advisor, Poincaré, nonetheless, although he passed him, gave him a, a less than stellar grade and he was banished to the French provinces. He, he languished in Besançon, and uh, he, he, he died virtually an unknown 40 years later. So this is a sad story. But <laughs> it seems that his dissertation was uh, more or less discovered by uh, Samuelson in the 50s, and uh, his contributions were brought to light. And today, we revere him. There's a society named after him, the Bachelier Finance Society, uh, which I'll talk about later. The other, uh, the, the second bullet point here, mentions four mathematicians who in particular laid the foundations of probability theory that are used today in math finance. So Kolmogorov uh, approached probability from a measure theoretic perspective. Paul Levy founded some of the most important properties of Brownian motion, which I mentioned earlier. Doblin was a French mathematician who, uh, who suffered a fate similar to Bachelier. I don't know what it is with these French mathematicians, but it seems that they... <laughs> so he was... Uh, that's true. He, um, he was sent to the... He, um, he had to, to fight in the war. And um, his contributions were actually sealed in a French vault for uh, 50 years, and they were only unsealed around 1999. And uh, then it was discovered that he had actually um, found what is now called Ito's Lemma, after uh, Kiyosi Ito, who published his results, Ito published his results in 1944, 
but Doblin had actually discovered them more than a decade earlier. And um, anyway, but they were unknown to uh, anyone but Doblin, it seems, and uh, until, uh, until very recently. So um, it, the, uh, the, these four names, Komogorov, Levy, Doblin, Ido, were, were prominent in the 30s and 40s. In the 50s, 1950s, we saw uh, Paul Samuelson, uh, the first economist to win the Nobel Prize, and a physicist named Mike Osborne, uh, both more or less simultaneously discovering what is now called geometric Brownian motion, which is a variation on the Brownian motion that Bachelier discovered, which is actually the process that most people consider to be the workhorse of derivatives pricing. In the 70s, especially 1973, a watershed year, Black, Scholes, and Merton conspired to uh, invent what is now called Black, Merton, Scholes theory of derivatives pricing. Uh, Scholes and Merton won the Nobel Prize in 1997. Black was mentioned specifically by name, but he had died the year before, so he was ineligible to win. The, um, you know, the um, Scholes and Merton actually uh, joined a hedge, were at a hedge fund at the time they won in 1997 called Long-Term Capital Management, which is a <laughs> somewhat ignominious name at this point. In 1998, they uh, seemed to be the culprits behind a worldwide financial crisis, which <laughs> fortunately was resolved. So. Um, in uh, 1976, Cox and Ross formulated a theory which uh, they, they termed risk-neutral pricing, which turned out to be very important. There was much foundational work done up at Stanford um, by Harrison and Kreps and Harrison and Pliska that, um, that grew on that work and that laid the foundations for mathematicians, emphasizing the role of martingales in the theory. Later, in the, uh, in the 80s, we saw uh, a theory called HJM for Heath Gerald Morton, and after that, in the 90s, a theory called BGM for Brace Gatorak Musiella, both of which used the foundations laid down by Harrison et al., uh, and essentially was a, really the first work to emphasize the probabilistic formation as opposed to the PDE based view uh, when it comes to math finance. In, more recently, in, the, in our century, we've seen work by, for example, Archner, Delbian, Heathy, Bear on um, various so called coherent risk measures. And I think most recently, some, uh, some work that I think is important and will be uh, perhaps discussed in the third talk for today is some work by David Lee. It was mentioned in the Wall Street Journal just this year, uh, well, actually last year uh, in May. And uh, he essentially formulated the use of what's called a Gaussian copula in the pricing of, uh, of credit default swaps and um, synthetic collateralized default obligations. So um, he, um, anyway, the, he's, uh, this, these, this kind of work has, uh, is, I think, revolutionizing uh, finance, allowing it to be much easier to uh, bring together uh, various um, disparate asset classes. So I'd like to uh, just quickly go through an A to Z of mathematicians contributing to math finance. So um, starting with A, we have Marco Avellaneda, who's at NYU, where I am. Um, where I'm the director of the math finance program. And then we have a long list of distinguished mathematicians. I, I don't have time to go through all their names, but some of them I'm sure you recognize. Some of them won Fields medals. <coughs> Some of them are sure to win Fields medals <laughs> or Nobel Prizes. And um, the, uh, it seems that uh, most mathematicians, especially on the applied math side, have, uh, well, many have contributed uh, papers in the field of math finance. And um, when we go to the, uh, the second half of the alphabet, uh, we end with our second speaker, Thalia Zarifopoulou, who, uh, who's made many important contributions, which she'll be surveying shortly. I'd also like to talk about prominent finance academics contributing to math finance. So I mentioned Samuelson and Black and Scholes already. I'd like to emphasize uh, Robert Merton's work. He, um, he, he won the Nobel, as I already mentioned, in 1997 along with Scholes. But I think he, um, he, does, he, he actually developed the um, arbitrage-based approach to derivatives pricing as opposed to an equilibrium-based approach, which is actually the foundation which all, all the research sprung from. And um, I've already mentioned Cox and Ross, so I'll move next to Leland and Rubenstein, who are at Berkeley, so in the UC system. And um, they are perhaps notorious for uh, work in, this, in the 80s on uh, portfolio insurance, which I'll get to later. Uh, still in California, I'd like to s emphasize uh, Duffy and Singleton, who are at Stanford doing important work in credit and also in um, spectral methods or Fourier-based methods to asset pricing theory. Brennan and Schwartz at UCLA were my advisors. Uh, Brennan is now retired. Longstaff and Schwartz also at UCLA. Um, and lastly, I'll just mention the three editors of uh, the, perhaps the main journal in the field, which is called Mathematical Finance, and the three editors so far have been Stan Pliska, Bob Jarrow, and Dilute Medan. So there's much math used in math finance. It is um, interdisciplinary even within mathematics. So we see um, perhaps stochastic calculus being used mostly, followed by um, 
PDEs, both linear and nonlinear, um, to implement um, stochastic calculus. Monte Carlo simulation is widely used in industry. It's the uh, most general and flexible method. We also see wide use of finite differences, finite elements less so, and spectral methods somewhat. We see functional analysis being used, the use of semigroups and eigenfunctions and so forth. Integral transforms of all kinds, uh, complex analysis used for in inverting those transforms. Pseudo differential operators, maximum. These last three bullet points are actually, they come from essentially three different fields of math, but they're all used to describe the same fundamental principle in finance. So the maximum principle you think we primarily associate with PDEs. But from a finance perspective, it's essentially the idea that the price of a contingent claim should be not, never greater nor less than the maximum value it can take or the minimum value it can take. The fundamental theorem of linear algebra, which we teach to undergraduates, actually can be taught from a financial perspective, which would hopefully make them appreciate <laughs> the, uh, the beauty and subtleness of it much more. The Hanna-Banach theorem is actually the traditional way that the so-called fundamental theorems of asset pricing formulated by Harrison are presented. Uh, we also see Lie groups in recent work, regular and singular perturbation theory for um, solving PDEs that are not amenable to closed form solution. Optimal control is widely used, and I'm sure Thalia will be talking a little bit about that. Uh, variational inequalities, similarly. Differential geometry has been used lately uh, in problems to solve uh, option pricing with stochastic volatility. Uh, people um, consider Brownian motion running on a Poincaré, on a, um, on a manifold. Um, uh, hyperbolic, uh, using hyperbolic geometry in particular. String theory has been used in fixed income. Game theory is, is actually widely used, mainly from the economic side. Inverse problems are extremely important to practitioners, where it's essential that all models be calibrated. And uh, lastly and not least, we see statistics and econometrics, especially time series in wide use, especially by hedge funds and so on, looking for profitable trading strategies. So math finance is often seen as a sub-discipline of finance, and finance itself is often seen as a sub-discipline of economics. That's a traditional view. Uh, my experience since leaving academia is that neither need be so. Uh, math finance is af actually practiced in industry often by physicists, by uh, mathematicians, by engineers who have been taught no finance and yet are able to fully cope <laughs> with, uh, with math finance. Um, Finance itself can be seen as, a, as not a sub-discipline of economics, but rather a reaction to economics. When Markowitz, uh, who's credited with uh, Nobel for his work in portfolio theory, first presented his work to, um, to his thesis advisor, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Friedman lamented, this is not economics, and uh, it wasn't at the time, uh, but I think that economics has come to embrace many of the ideas that first were found in finance. So derivatives pricing theory, is probably the most widely used subdiscipline of math finance, and this is the area I work in. The basic idea behind the theory is that the price of a derivative security should be given by the cost of replicating its payoff. In the uh, standard theory, there is no arbitrage and frictionless markets, which would essentially annihilate the existence of investment banks that I've worked for in the past. <laughs> and uh, these two assumptions jointly imply the existence of a positive linear pricing operator. So the positive means that if the payoff is positive, the price will be positive. The linear means that if you double the payoff, you'll double the price. And um, as a result, derivatives pricing theory has been famously characterized by certain economists as ketchup economics. So when pricing two bottles of ketchup, the way uh, a derivatives pricing theorist would do it is to first figure out how much one bottle of ketchup costs and then double the price. So uh, this is obviously a, a jab at perhaps the uh, simplicity in the, uh, in the thinking behind um, derivatives pricing theory. Um, in a related vein, uh, Niels Hackinson of, the, of Berkeley, the UC system, has called this the catch-22 of derivatives pricing theory, which is that if this, according to the standard theory, derivatives are redundant, so then if derivatives are redundant, why do they exist? So something to think about, but as, as I'd like to say, Mark, as Mark Twain once wrote, common sense ain't so common, <laughs> and uh, no practitioners that I know of think that derivatives are redundant. In fact, the closer someone is to the market, the less likely they are to value two ketchup bottles at twice the unit price, I think. And if you go to the, the supermarket as opposed to the financial market and actually look at a 64-ounce bottle of ketchup and compare it to the 32-ounce price, I think you'll see <laughs> that, in fact, uh, linearity does not hold. So while the standard pricing models are, in fact, linear, practitioners generally keenly appreciate the limited domain in which they operate. So um, in practice, people recognize that the models that are used are flawed, so they, uh, they stress the notion of model risk, and as a result, they set aside reserves. So when a trader claims to have done a deal that just scored him 
$10 million of P&L, profit and loss, he doesn't actually get the check right away. They set aside reserves and they um, just see whether or not the assumptions that went into the model that led to the proposed profit in fact bear out. So they'll, in the, they'll essentially take money out of reserves and pay the trader over the, say, five-year life of the deal as the assumptions seem to hold. So another thing that's commonly done in practice, in, in recognition of model risk, is to use several models simultaneously and then average the results. So we don't actually believe there being one truth <laughs> to which we uh, set all our time to find out. We, uh, so, so we, we essentially simultaneously um, embrace the notion of several realities operating in the same sphere and um, with contradictory assumptions. And uh, nonetheless, we can use the results of these theories essentially by averaging them, even though there's inconsistency, and as I promised, logic will be eschewed in this talk. <laughs> so finally, I'd like to talk about um, other things that people do in terms of, uh, in terms of dealing with model risk. So um, a model will typically have fixed parameters. So for example, th the volatility of a stock in the Black-Scholes model is thought of as constant. So the first thing any practitioner will do is shock <laughs> the parameter thought of as constant and figure out the sensitivity to the model. And furthermore, they'll actually form portfolios that are insensitive to variations in a parameter, which in the model is not even allowed to vary. And uh, so these are all attempts to deal in real time with the failures of models, which, ca which practitioners keenly appreciate. And um, I think fortunately, it uh, keeps uh, quants like me in business. Uh, nobody argues that quants are redundant. And much time is spent actually trying to find robust pricing and hedging strategies. I have a background uh, from academia. I was a professor at Cornell in the uh, finance department for eight years. And um, I used to get calls from time to time from people on Wall Street, and they'd say, so how do you hedge an option? And I'd say, you idiot. You use the delta. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I realized I was the idiot, that um, actually uh, they knew that. Uh, they were actually looking for something that uh, was robust. And uh, so um, it's... Um, it's very important, I think, when you're talking to practitioners to listen carefully to what they're saying and uh, to not necessarily assume that they're using the words in the same way that you're used to thinking about them. So uh, I wrote this uh, bullet point that, to my knowledge, there are no undergrad programs solely devoted to math finance. And now I find, to my horror, that UCSB is actually thinking of starting one. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> pardon me? Have one. You have one. I see. Well, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Perhaps I should sit down. Uh, <laughs> the uh, first master's program in math finance uh, was offered by Carnegie Mellon University in 1992, and there's now over 100 programs, uh, master's programs internationally. A typical master's program requires one to one and a half years of full-time attendance, and most programs in big cities also offer part-time. Uh, at NYU, we have both. The, the programs are usually offered out of math or the engineering departments or both. Um, at NYU, it's offered out of the math department. There is no engineering department at NYU. Um, the programs are sometimes offered out of the business school as a standalone program. So, for example, at Berkeley, the Haas Business School offers a financial engineering degree. Or it might be offered as a track. So, for example, at MIT, the Sloan School offers financial engineering as a subdiscipline within the MBA as a track. So, graduates of these master's programs will typically go to industry. These are designed for people to go to industry as opposed to doing a PhD in, uh, in finance or math finance. So at NYU, the, the graduates uh, often go to big banks or to a hedge fund as traders' assistants. Uh, joining a quant group such as I work in is actually fairly rare. Usually that's um, the sole domain of PhDs in physics, math, and math finance. It's, it's good to know if you're an undergrad that actually doctoral programs almost never require a master's degree. So if you're thinking of pursuing a, a PhD and you're an undergrad now, you don't need to waste a year, a year and a half <laughs> getting a master's degree. You can go straight to a doctoral program. Uh, it's common for doctoral students in, in math, engineering, computer science, or physics to get interested in math finance at about the thesis stage when they realize that a job may not be quite as readily available as they first thought when they entered the program. And um, they typically go into the industry uh, primarily as quants in banks uh, or as hedge or joining hedge funds, insurance companies, or software companies. Uh, some PhDs uh, from physics or in math, engineering, or computer science uh, do go into academia, either as a postdoc, so for example at NYU we take postdocs, or uh, obviously here as well. And um, less commonly, uh, there are tenure track positions in math finance. Some of the leading schools 
have started tenure track positions in math finance. So uh, Roger Lee, a co-author of mine, is tenure track at Chicago. Columbia is looking for an assistant professor, I know, uh, tenure track. Cambridge, in fact, uh, hired Peter Fries out of, out of uh, Courant, uh, tenure track, and now he's tenured. Cornell, I know, is looking for a tenure track person in the engineering school. And there's others. I have to say that PhDs in uh, math, engineering, computer science, or physics who study math finance almost never go to business school, finance departments. That's typically a closed market, so I wouldn't even try. A uh, few do go to industry. Um, sorry, I, um, uh, sorry, I skipped a bullet point there. So um, the finance departments and business schools will typically hire econ, econ or finance PhDs. And, um, they, uh, and a few finance PhDs do go to industry, but most, I think, stay in academia. Some universities, I should mention, now offer PhDs in math finance. So Carnegie Mellon has been doing so for several years. At Imperial College, um, my co-author, Claudio Albanese, actually offers an executive PhD in math finance, uh, a novel undertaking, to say the least. If you're interested in um, learning math finance and you have a math background, then there are several books on the subject that are aimed at mathematicians as the target audience. So if, I'll just mention the authors, and you can go to Amazon and find the titles. Uh, my slides will be available after the talk. Uh, so Thomas Bjork has a book, Daryl Duffy. Uh, there's a recent one by Monique Jean Blanc, Marc Yor, and Marc Cheney. There's, there's two separate books, both Springer, um, Yuziela Rutkowski, and Bielecki and Rutkowski, the latter on credit derivatives. There's um, a famous book by Karatsis and Shreve on math finance, as opposed to one on brand motion and stochastic calculus. There's a book by Shreve that I use in my course, Continuous Time Finance, that I teach at Courant. It's uh, volume two, and I think it's a very good introduction to the field. And finally, there's a, a volume by Albert Shriayev, uh, one of the um, leaders in probability theory, uh, who, um, which he wrote about math finance. There's also books on math finance and econophysics aimed at physicists. So um, Montaigne and Eugene Stanley of BU have a book. Bouchot and Potters have one. And there's one by Kirill Alinsky, uh, A Physicist's Guide to, uh, to Finance. Some important conferences uh, that if you're interested in math finance, you might think about attending. The Bachelier Finance Congress is organized, um, is, is organized every two years. Thalia actually uh, organized the one in Crete in, uh, four years ago. And uh, we just had one in Tokyo. Uh, the next one will be in London in 2008. There's uh, the annual CCCP conference. Uh, it's a little play on words. It's got nothing to do with the former Soviet Union. It's, uh, <laughs> it's actually uh, four schools that figure prominently in, in math finance on the East Coast. Uh, Carnegie, Columbia, Cornell, and Princeton. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an annual derivative securities conference that's been going on for almost 20 years now. It started at Queens. It migrated to Cornell. It migrated to Washington with the CFTC. And now, finally, it's in Houston. There's uh, an, an annual conference in, um, in Warwick called the FORC Conference. It stands for Futures and Options Research Center. And there's numerous practitioner conferences. I have to warn you that the attendance fees for these practitioner conferences are typically $2,000 or more. But uh, if you can get in as a speaker, then you can, speak, then you can attend for free. And um, that's usually my ticket. And anyway, RISC and uh, ICBI, a big conference producer, uh, put these on. ICBI is primarily European. RISC is both American and European. Uh, ICBI's Global Derivatives Conference in Paris is what I'd call the uh, equivalent of the Academy Awards. It's the place to go and, and uh, be seen and uh, preen in front of the cameras and so forth. So um, the, uh, and lastly, uh, on this coast, the, um, there's a conference Gifford Fung organizes called the Journal of Investment Management Conference, and it's going to be in San Francisco. In spring of 2007, I understand the Q Group is also having a conference as we speak uh, right near here. And uh, it's perhaps too late to attend that, but that seems to be going on in this neighborhood. So there are um, various academic journals in math finance. It, these are um, to be contrasted with the <coughs> academic finance journals, the big four being um, Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, Review of Financial Studies, and Journal of Financial Quantitative Analysis. So there are these um, journals devoted, I'd say, to math finance uh, that I'll list here from the academic perspective. So these are Mathematical Finance, Finance and Stochastics, Quantitative Finance, which is out of England, Journal of Computational Finance, Review of Derivatives Research, Applied Math Finance, also out of England, and International Journal of Theoretical and Applied Finance. There are also various industry journals. So there's, um, these are journals that uh, are aimed primarily at practitioners. And um, they're not listed in any particular order, but we have Journal of Derivatives, Journal of Fixed Income. Risk Magazine is a very prominent um, magazine that uh, comes out monthly that uh, usually has a technical article section that usually features the work of leading quantitative theorists in the industry. Wilmot Magazine 
uh, was mentioned earlier. It was started by uh, an infamous quant, Paul Wilmot, and um, he, has a, he organizes a website, uh, wilmot.com, uh, where you can uh, chatter about um, master's programs or issues in math finance and what have you. Uh, journal of Risk and Journal of Credit Risk and Journal of Operational Risk all have the word risk in the, uh, in the title, which is not a surprise since the publisher is risk. So, um, <coughs> and now I'd like to talk about uh, some applications of math finance in the 10 minutes or so that I have left, uh, I'd like to talk about the D word, derivatives. <laughs> so um, derivatives such as forwards, futures, and options have a long history. Uh, Thales of Greece actually is credited of, uh, with being the first person to, uh, to trade an, an options contract. Uh, so our next speaker, Thalia, is not actually named after Thales, despite her prominent mathematical stature. <laughs> Thales was uh, considered the, uh, the first mathematician, actually, uh, of Greece. And um, he was also a very clever businessman. He, uh, he realized that uh, there was going to be a short supply of, uh, of olives in the future due to a freeze. And so he, uh, he actually took options on olive presses. And so he, he more or less cornered the market on, uh, on options way back in uh, classical Greece <laughs> and made himself a, a rich man as a result. <laughs> so uh, derivatives are actually quite colorful history. There's famous episodes like the tulip bulb uh, episode in Amsterdam in the 1700s, for example, where you could ex buy tulip bulbs for thousands of Dutch guilders. Um, and uh, they have a checkered history. They're actually at various times banned in the United States. Um, they uh, presently trade either over the counter, such as currency options or on a listed exchange, so for, so for example, stock options, or it could be both over the counter and on an exchange. So stock options, for example, trade in both places. Derivatives always have an underlying, which is often called a primary. Um, the underlying can be an asset and, and is, for example, in the case of a stock option, but the underlying may not be an asset. So a stock index is not actually an asset. The reason being is that S&P, which makes the S&P Standard Poor's, which makes the S&P 500, for example, will actually change the composition of the 500 stocks that makes up the S&P uh, <laughs> midway through the life of an option, which can cause incredible headaches for, uh, for somebody who's, who, say, is trying to hedge with the underlying stocks, which actually nobody would ever do. Um, sometimes the underlying can be stored. So, for example, wheat can be stored. Sometimes it's going to be partially stored. So, for example, there are futures on eggs, and uh, you can store eggs for a little while, but not for too long, as you know, uh, if you opened your refrigerator lately. And um, sometimes the underlying can't be stored at all. So, uh, some t there are derivatives on weather, for example, written on the temperature. You can't store the temperature, although it seems that Santa Barbara has uh, managed <laughs> to do so. <laughs> um, uh, there are derivatives on electricity, and you can't store electricity. And so, there's many underlyings that cannot be stored, and this changes the theory somewhat substantially. The uh, security underlying derivative security can have more liquidity than the derivative or less. So, um, for example, there are options on dollar euro and, you know, the dollar euro exchange rate is incredibly liquid. Uh, you know, currencies in general are extremely liquid. The, uh, there's trillions of, uh, when you convert to dollars, there's trillions of dollars changing hands every day in the currencies market. Um, the, the underlying could have less liquidity, or the derivative could have less liquidity than the underlying. So, for example, um, credit default swaps are written on corporate bonds, and um, I imagine um, Peter Cotton will be talking a bit about those, and um, they're actually, the bonds themselves are less liquid than the credit default swaps, so you have a case where the underlying is less liquid than the derivative. So the underlying can be considered a primary asset, so for example, in the case of a bond option, the underlying is a bond, which is considered a fundamental primary asset. But the underlying could be a derivative itself. So there are things called swaptions, for example, where the underlying is a swap, and then the swap is itself considered a derivative. Another example is that there are options on VIX. VIX stands for volatility index, and the volatility index is itself composed of a static portfolio of um, European options. So you, you have here a, an option on a portfolio of options. So the question I'd like to pose in the few minutes I have left is, are derivatives evil? So, uh, in the uh, wake of North Korea's nuclear test last week, the South Korean military has proposed opening a market in synthetic CDOs, heeding billionaire investor Warren Buffett's characterization of derivatives as weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> so, um, in 2006, uh, former Enron CEO Jeff Skilling was found guilty of fraud, so this year, and he's still awaiting sentencing, and he faces up to 25 years in prison. Enron was once the seventh largest corporation in America, and it had championed the notion of electricity derivatives, it was blamed for the rolling blackouts that roiled California. So when asked how many years Skilling should face, most Californians called for a revival of the electric chair. <laughs> um, okay, and lastly, um, on the question of are derivatives evil, it should be mentioned that in 1994, Orange County in Southern California famously lost huge sums of money, betting incorrectly that interest rates would not rise. 
The subsequent tax increase forced Disneyland to raise admission fees, so I do think derivatives are definitely evil. <laughs> Another example in, uh, along these lines is in October 1987, so many years ago, when I was a doctoral student at UCLA, in fact, there were approximately $100 billion of equities covered by, in quotes, portfolio insurance, which is a novel financial strategy att which attempts to place a floor on the value of a stock portfolio by attempting to replicate the payoff of a put. The leading provider of this form of portfolio insurance was LOR, which stands for Leyland O'Brien Rubenstein, which started by two Berkeley professors I mentioned earlier, Leyland and Rubenstein. It turns out on page 19 of their standard contract, uh, a footnote mentioned that this form of portfolio insurance doesn't work in a crash. <laughs> well, in, 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 um, in October 1987, uh, there was a crash, uh, which actually uh, the Dow moved uh, 22 standard deviations, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, should only happen once every ice age or so, and in fact happened uh, less than uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, the Brady uh, Commission uh, blamed, actually, portfolio insurers, mentioning LOR by name, for mechanically selling stock index futures on Black Monday, which is October 19th, 1987. But, you know, the strategy called for them to sell futures when the stock index fell, and that's exactly what they did. But in fact, they undersold compared to what their strategy said they should do. And in fact, that strategy itself undersold compared to what you would do knowing that a crash was going on. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of their underselling, many uh, clients of Leyland O'Brien Rubenstein actually had their floors violated, i.e. the portfolio insurance did not work. And uh, this discredited portfolio insurance for many years. So we see some very colorful checkered history in derivatives, and I hope nobody cancels the program here as a result, but uh, anyway, I think that it's um, important to know the history, but it's also important to know that many senior uh, economists and um, um, people think derivatives play a vital role in today's economy. And um, I mean, I think that Steve Ross actually has a nice way of uh, explaining derivatives. So he, he likens them to a scalpel. You would want a scalpel in the hands of a surgeon when you're undergoing surgery, at the same time, you wouldn't want a, scampo, a scalpel in the hands of a thug when you're walking down the streets of New York, as I sometimes do. So uh, it's, all, it's a tool, and it's got to be used you know, skillfully. Uh, it can be used um, for adverse purposes. But I think that to uh, ban derivatives, as has been called for, for example, after the crash of 87, is a little, t is a little too strong. So math finance is not strictly about derivatives. It's also used in risk measurement and management. So banks are exposed to market risk, which is a possibility that losses will arise due to adverse marking of assets and liabilities. And so banks calculate a risk measure known as value at risk on a daily basis. This risk measure has its flaws, as many uh, critics have pointed out, and this has led to alternative risk measures, such as the theory I mentioned earlier by um, Artsner, El, uh, Delbion, Eber, and Heath on uh, coherent risk measures. In the wake of corporate scandals, such as Enron that I mentioned earlier, but also WorldCom, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was passed in 2002, and one of its many uh, provisions was to force CEOs to sign off on the accuracy of their firm's financial statements. So as intended, this has led actually to renewed emphasis on risk management function inside many corporations. As you can imagine, uh, before the CEO signs off on the financial statements, he's going to make darn sure that uh, those financial statements are accurate now, and that his um, derriere is on the line. And uh, so there's um, been a, a, a great deal of emphasis placed on the risk management function and um, I think that uh, Sarbanes-Oxley is, is to be credited for this. Uh, on the banking side, we see continuing banking reforms from Basel. We're presently in something called Basel II, and um, this has led to research in alternative forms of risk besides market risk, such as counterparty credit risk and operational risk. Math finance is also used in something called asset and liability management, commonly abbreviated ALM. So um, pension plans have long-term fixed liabilities. Insurance companies also do. And um, they tend to invest on the asset side in equities in order to uh, take advantage of the higher average return that equities offer. And as a result, there's also higher variance in equities, and so w this leads to the field of asset and liability management, which has actually been a quantitative field for many years. But it seems that more recently, uh, people engaging in asset liability management have begun to embrace the methods used in the derivatives pricing field, which are, you could say, market-oriented quantitative techniques that essentially worship the wisdom of markets and uh, essentially try to mine the information out of prices. Um, variable annuities are also uh, a set of contracts that where math finance techniques can be applied profitably. So insurance companies 
in, instead of offering uh, fixed annuities, which uh, offer a fixed payment from the time you retire until the time you die, they've offered variable annuities where the payoff depends on the performance of the stock market over your life, uh, between, say, now when you take on the, uh, the life insurance policy and when you retire. And um, in order to, uh, because of regulatory constraints, the insurance companies were forced to build in guarantees into these variable annuities. So there's a certain minimum amount that you're guaranteed to get when you retire, and then you could get more if the stock market does well. Uh, so in a sense, the, derivative, um, the insurance companies are selling derivatives. They're selling put options to their um, uh, policyholders. And these derivatives are actually long-term, say 20 years, and they're often path-dependent, so they're actually quite tricky to price and, um, and especially tricky to hedge. So in fact, many insurance companies were using actuarial approaches as opposed to market-based approaches to hedge these variable annuities, and this actually led to large losses during the last bear market of 2000 or so. As a result, most insurers now actually delta hedge their, uh, their equities ex exposures, and there's a lot of room, I think, in applying better hedging techniques than just delta hedging for these um, portfolios. Another application of math finance that's particularly hot right now is something called algorithmic trading. So uh, there's actually an article on Business Week that emphasized this this year. So if market prices are martingales, then this means that you can either gain or lose on average from non-anticipating trading strategies. But I don't think that markets are martingales, and anybody who's actually been on Wall Street uh, who I think would agree, um, there's actually many academics that are coming around to this point of view. There was a paper published in um, respected uh, academic finance journals a few years ago which presaged, actually, the uh, mutual fund scandal that was in the media about a year ago. And uh, the paper documented that you could, in fact, make money systematically by uh, taking positions in mutual funds that had uh, cross-country positions. So the idea was, if you had a mutual fund which had positions in both American markets and UK markets, then, uh, as you know, the UK markets close roughly around noon. Uh, well, I'm thinking from a New York perspective, to be honest. So. <laughs> I can't do the time change in real time, so let me talk about it from a New York perspective. So uh, in the, the, the London markets close roughly around noon in New York, and um, the, uh, the uh, point is, is that if there's, then there's four hours after that where the American market is open, and if the American market goes up, then it's well known empirically that the, um, the, um, the um, international, so let's say London markets, would tend to go up the next day. So you could actually buy the mutual fund at the close knowing that uh, the price you'd pay would be based just on the performance of the, um, of the uh, American stocks and the stale UK stocks, so you'd actually be buying at a discount. And then the next day, uh, on average, the UK market would rise and you'd have a profit. So anyway, well, that's one example of, um, of being able to anticipate market movements. I'm not sure if you followed that, but there's actually many others. And, um, it used to be believed, uh, like when I was a doctoral student at UCLA, which we used to call University of Chicago at Los Angeles, that uh, markets were extremely efficient, that you couldn't systematically make profits uh, by uh, betting on market movements. There's this old joke about a $10 bill lying on the ground that University of Chicago theorists refused to pick up because if it were really a $10 bill, you know, it wouldn't really be there. Um, so anyway, but uh, it seems that in this century, Increases in CPU power have actually led many academics to abandon the view that markets are efficient and, in fact, start hedge funds to exploit these so-called anomalies. So I know of one in particular. It's called uh, automatic trading, Automated Trading Desk. It was uh, started by an academic from NYU who was um, engaged in the theory of market microstructure. And this firm actually places hundreds of orders per second uh, from their office, which is actually in um, North Carolina. And um, anyway, they've actually considered moving to New York simply to... Uh, because the speed of light is apparently too slow for the, considering the number of, t of times that they actually place orders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, <coughs> there's um, yet other applications of math finance. Portfolio insurance that I mentioned earlier, which failed, is actually uh, back in NY use in an alternative form called constant proportion portfolio insurance. It was actually invented by Fisher Black in 1968, but he more or less kept it under his hat until 1987. And then he, he popularized it, and I, I, I couldn't help but have one equation in my talk. I actually give talks usually full <laughs> of equations. And, uh, and um, anyway, I, uh, the, the one equation that Fisher Black made famous is that exposure <laughs> equals multiple times cushion. And there's no square there. Mm -hmm. um, but I put a footnote that there is no square there. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, there's many active research areas in math finance. I've already mentioned stochastic volatility, and there's, there's many others. I've mentioned algorithmic tradings. Um, from, a from a practitioner perspective, 
Um, the inverse problems and calibration issues are extremely important. I'd like to close with some open problems in math finance. So um, one problem that's kind of like the four color problem, which was actually solved in math, but more or less remains open in math finance, is simple closed form formula for an American put in the Black-Scholes model. Actually, uh, a recent issue of Quantitative Finance proposed such a solution, but the, the, it took over a page to list the formula, so uh, <laughs> I consider the problem to remain open. And there are others. Um, <clears throat> so just to summarize, there's uh, continuing demand from industry for quantitatively oriented students, which bodes well for master's and PhD level programs in math finance and undergrad programs. So this demand stems from several sources, ready availability of data, say from Bloomberg, computing, rise in computing power, legal reforms, the rise and occasional fall in the case of Amaranth of hedge funds, and um, also the, perhaps the softening of MBA programs. Uh, I've, I've, my wife actually teaches an MBA program and she's always um, lamenting how, uh, how the, uh, the math requirements continue to decrease in, uh, in such programs. So um, math finance should benefit considerably from the input provided by uh, UCSB's considerable quantitative talents, and I, I welcome this input. Thank you very much. <coughs> My talk will be orthogonal to what Peter talked about. And um, I will uh, talk to you uh, more as a mathematician. I will uh, concentrate on a specific example, if you like, or a specific uh, line of research that uh, is emerging as an important one. And then I will guide you, I will take you to a very technical uh, journey. And some formulas will be on, on the screen, but uh, I will uh, translate them into English with the Greek accent. So don't, <laughs> to, to, don't worry about the formulas. You will see. I just want to convey um, to our friends here how much mathematics and how much different mathematics is involved in order to answer some very, very fundamental questions in, uh, in one area of mathematical finance. And uh, some of the work I will discuss today is uh, joined with uh, Marek Michela, who is one of the founders of the BGM model that uh, Peter talked about. And um, I will uh, go, uh, I will say very few words about academia and basically derivatives. When I talk about financial industry, so far we see a lot of development in derivative securities. And then I will uh, talk about uh, the investment banking and um, utility theory. And I will um, discuss with you some uh, difficulties we see there and um, share with you some of the concerns I have about why we don't see this explosion we see in derivatives, we don't see this in investments. And uh, then I will uh, discuss um, an alternative uh, approach that could be useful in uh, initiating some paths in investment research. And then I will uh, talk to you about uh, the, uh, the optimal allocations that we get, the portfolio dynamics, and I will uh, finish my talk with um, a very real discussion, meaning I will have a client and a manager, and the client will say, I want to do this and this and this, and then a lot of mathematics will enter, and the manager will say, if you want to do this and this and this, this is how much it will cost you. But in, the, in, 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 in this discussion, there will be so much mathematics behind this, the scenes. And this is what I would like to share with you. So, um, as uh, Peter talked to you about, there is a real and ideal relationship between uh, investment banking and Martingale theory. It was a perfect marriage, right moment and right place. There is a beautiful theory behind the, uh, there's the risk neutral valuation theory, there, was, there were the mathematical tools and everything took off. And of course, um, there are many simplifications and 
There's a lot of uh, theoretical, you know, many theoretical assumptions, but at the end of the day, it started a big industry, and there are wonderful, wonderful uh, applications of stochastic calculus in real life problems. And uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, derivatives, but um, what we do is we have a claim that is written on an underlying security. We want to quote a price. And the Black and Scholes Merton theory says that I can create the price by taking an expectation under the appropriate measure. There, as I said, there is excellent mathematics behind, uh, behind it, and we can compute it. There are, of course, in practice, there are many imperfections. And when we price derivatives, we want to, we still use the expectation uh, for to compute the price and we need to choose a measure and so on, but everything is in place. Investments, though. In a sense, um, I use a very strong word, not because the relationship is that bad, but uh, derivatives and academia um, are doing so well together that when you look at investments and academic research, then in my view, there is a lot, there's a lot of space there, and perhaps uh, we can contribute quite a bit from the academic point of view and from the uh, with very active interaction with the, the industry. So, if you look at uh, the classical utility theory, a beautiful, a masterpiece in economics, we see that. Um, is it is formulated in an abstract way and it is not very common to see real practical applications of the utility theory. And I talked to managers and I, I was trying, since my background is in stochastic control and in portfolio management and in utility theory, I was trying to coordinate with them and speak the same language and trying to say, if this is my utility and this is what I want to do, how come we cannot say it in practice? And I'm not quite sure where, in which direction this was all Greek to me or to them. <laughs> we were lost in translation. And um, um, what do we mean when we talk about a utility? And at this point, I would like to say that when we deal with derivatives, we don't care about the way we feel for the risk we are going to undertake because the uh, mathematical theory of derivatives gives us a way to kill that risk. So it doesn't really matter if you and I have different ways to, to feel towards something we cannot control. Since we can control it and we kill it, who cares? But uh, when we deal with investments and we want to look at uh, uh, higher returns and there is, it's absolutely clear that we need to take a certain amount of risk. It is important to incorporate how we feel towards that risk. And one way to do that is to use what we um, call utilities. And um, in a very, very simple deterministic environment, we can think about the utility function as something that depends on our wealth whatever that wealth is, and something that depends on time. And of course, if I'm a fund manager, or if, I, if, if I'm a quant, if I have 30 years ahead of me, or a day, or a week to report, the time is, plays a very different role in what I do. Now, what are the fundamental characteristics of a way to measure the way we feel? Okay. Uh, we are humans, and um, we like more to less. So we want to have increasing um, functions. We are risk averse, and um, this is uh, related to the concavity of the functions we uh, involve in our uh, modeling. And we are impatient, which means that um, if everything is kept the same, I would rather have a dollar today than having it tomorrow. Okay, so these are typical traits of uh, 
uh, human nature that we like to model in our problems. It doesn't have to be that simple. It can be much more complicated. We can have recursivity. We can have all kinds of things. And as I say, as I said, the utility theory is a, is a masterpiece of economics. And so what I want to discuss today is perhaps an alternative way that is uh, that to me sounds promising in uh, applications in investments. And of course, uh, the, the fundamental ideas of utility go back to the beginning of the century uh, with the brilliant minds of these people and many more that, that I don't list here. So what is, uh, what is the traditional framework? Something we see, uh, we don't see that in derivatives. As I said, my, what I will talk to you about is very orthogonal to what Peter uh, mentioned. I will, talk, I will not talk about derivatives, I will talk about investments, and I will talk to you from the perspective of a technical person, a mathematician who has a problem in, in quantitative finance, uh, translates it into the technical language, and at the end of the day gives a practical answer. So this is how I will uh, guide you. You know, this is the journey we will take together. So in, in the traditional utility theory, I have a criterion that is imposed at the end of the horizon. So we say that 30 years from now, I will feel that way. And of course, there is a rich class of models that give you this, um, this uh, little U. Let me see how the little mouse, oh. like that? It will take me down there. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, for these utility problems, we have the, the beautiful theory of stochastic control. And in a sense, uh, we want to, because we want to maximize the expected utility, we have a criterion at the end of the horizon. I take the expectation, I look at my initial conditions, and I do the best I can. Okay. Don't forget that in derivatives, there is one thing we do. We kill the risk. But here, we cannot do that. So we do the best we can under the circumstances, meaning under the set of admissible controls that we can, uh, uh, we can have. And of course, uh, there is um, a way to uh, solve this problem. And uh, this is uh, the central piece of stochastic control the classical Bellman principle, that is a dynamic programming principle. And in a sense, in the traditional framework, for those of you who are familiar with stochastic control, the dynamic utility coincides with what we call the value function. There's a very nice theory how to compute the value function uh, through PDEs, if you have, through differential equations, if you have a very simple uh, modeling structure, or through duality, uh, the, the theory is there. How we, make, um, how we make it applied is a different story, and this is where perhaps we need to revise the way we view these problems. Now, let's look at practice. And it is very difficult to think about utility. In a sense, if I am a fund manager and I need to make decisions today, how do I know the way I will feel 30 years from now. So this is, to me, conceptually um, uh, a, a real difficulty. The other thing is, even though there is this beautiful theory of stochastic control that gives you a very nice characterization of the solution, there is very little we can do, there is very little we can say about the actual output, that if you have this amount of money and this is the way you feel, this is what you should do. And in derivatives, we have that. We have the theory, and we have the answers, and we have the practical implications. But in utility, we don't have that. If you look at the fourth point, as I explained, it is very difficult, very almost impossible, unless you have a very simplistic structure or in your model, to say what is the solution today, this, the capital U that I have there. And of course, the most important thing is that it is very difficult to get concrete answers about my optimal allocation. What should I do today? Okay. 
So let's look at something that is um, an alternative way. And to many of you might uh, look uh, very unorthodox because in a sense is, is the approach that I presented to you upside down. But you will see that in, in, in many aspects it covers what the traditional utility framework offers. So how about I start with a very simple, uh, very simple thought. And I say, how about I don't concentrate just on utility, but I have some criterion about my performance, okay? How well will I do? Okay, how should I think about it? How well I'm doing must be compatible with how much I know up today, to today. And this is what I have here when you look at this little script, this capital script F uh, for, math for, for mathematicians, for probabilists. This is, in a sense, the information that I capture up to today's time. Okay. Then, um, as I said, utilities or performances or targets are increasing and concave functions. So the, uh, gradually I will introduce some technicalities. You don't have to, you can skip many of them. I will just go through some of the formula so that I convey to you what kind of mathematics we use. If you look at um, the way we, we think about the utility problem, if I start at any current time little less, then in the future we can see that no matter what I do, in conditional expectation, I will be going down. Because if I will be going up, the system will kick me out. I cannot be in a market in which I will outperform everybody. So if I want to stay in the market, I better make sure that I break even. And this is the last condition of optimality that I have there. Don't worry about the technicalities. Uh, just look at uh, the last line that says that you find a way in the environment in, where, in which you find yourself to satisfy your monotonicity, your risk aversion, your impatience. You find a way. If you cannot find that way, why should you be in this market? That's as simple as it can be. And, of course, uh, uh, you, you heard the word martingale. Prices are martingales, as Peter talked about. A martingale is a process that satisfies the last equality. It, a martingales carry a lot of uh, intuition, and uh, prices are martingales, and all optimal performances are martingales. Okay, so this is a very, in a sense, this logic is very clear, but it is extremely hard to solve this problem. So, let me formulate um, the, my control problem, but as I said, in a completely unorthodox way. So I will not do what the traditional utility, I mean, the traditional framework um, does. I will specify how I feel today. What is my performance of today? Where am I doing today? Where am I today? Am I doing well? Am I doing badly? If I'm doing well, is there any way I can continue doing well? So in a sense, this is like going forward in time. I don't specify my utility at the end and go backwards in time. I see how I feel today and I go forward in time. And of course, my objective is, as you see in this line, is to break even. If I keep bleeding, in performance, in my target, in my utility, I should leave, okay? If I can break even, that's fine. Of course, these uh, problems are extremely difficult to solve, and these are not the classical stochastic control problems. These are called inverse problems, which is a little bit ironic because we go forward in time. But nevertheless, they are very, very difficult to solve, and the, the theory is, the, the, the difficulties are very, very challenging. So basically, what have I told you so far? In a sense, I say, I say to myself, I can see how I feel today, right? Somehow, I have a way to quantify my performance, my target, my feelings, my, my utility, or my, my wishes. And of course, this is how I feel, right? But where am I going to be? 
As an investment manager, I will be in an environment that I will observe returns of uh, financial assets. I will face constraints. I will um, talk to a manager and the manager will tell me what do you want to achieve in a market with returns so and so. I might have my different views away from the market equilibrium that the, uh, the, the manager will talk to me about. I might want to compare what I get uh, in terms of a benchmark or in a more technical language in terms of a numerator. And I might, um, something that you will see will play a fundamental role in solving these problems is the way we think about time. And um, if I manage to go from left to right and incorporate my environment, my views, my constraints, with the way I feel, perhaps I can answer the question, what is that I can achieve and what is that I should do? What you see here is the most important thing of all. I am a client, I got a manager, I say this is what I want and the manager will tell me this is how much it will cost you and this is what I will do for you. Right? So the question will be, uh, the, the, the center of uh, the at attention is right there. Tomorrow, I will, everything will change the way I feel, my environment, and I will be doing the same thing. And the day after tomorrow, things will change. So in a sense, what have I done so far? In a sense, nothing I have described to you the difficulties, right? So I want to understand how myself changes every day, my, my, my feelings, my attitude towards risk, Will, will change because my monotonicity, my concavity, my impatience will, will change. So I will have a, a performance surface there. The environment in which I will uh, uh, be functioning will change, right? Will, will evolve stochastically. And I need to find a way to determine uh, what is the correct uh, variational input that has to do with me the market input that has to do with the environment in which I operate and how I can compile the two and get the answers that I want. And in a sense, what I, I presented just a couple seconds earlier shows that every day I will move and I will move and I will have to give an answer. Okay? So, if you look at what we are building, in a sense we are building a way to Construct a system, a solution system that moves with time, with constraints, with information, and with opportunities. What is that I want? What is that I can do? And in a sense, at the end of the day, these two must be compatible, right? Okay. So, some solutions. And as I said, um, This is not an easy problem because there is no, uh, there is the theory in stochastic control does not address these kind of problems. But nevertheless, with, a, with you will see a very nice interplay between stochastic calculus, differential equations, and uh, uh, stochastic control. Okay. So how can we solve this problem? As uh, I mentioned to you when I showed you these pictures, I should, be, I should try to find a way that I can combine the market in which I am with the utility that models who I am. And hopefully I can answer the question, what is the best I can do and how I can do this thing? All right, so this is in a sense the end of the uh, narrative part and some formulas will come in now. So my utility, my utility um, is described by the following constraint. Um, for those of you who are not very, very familiar with these three words, P, D, E, in a sense, a PDE is a condition between uh, several quantities that describe uh, partial derivatives of an unknown function. And this 
Equality tells me that you cannot want everything in life. If you are greedy, risk averse, and impatient, it doesn't work that way. Something needs to, um, you need to give in something. And this is what this uh, constraint tells me. How we came up with this constraint is, is a painful story. But um, we gain a lot of intuition from examples in very, very distinct model settings. A simple binomial um, a diffusion model. Uh, it, it took many, many months to come up with this. But in a sense, uh, intuition-wise, this tells you exactly what I said a couple seconds earlier. You are human, you want more, you don't want a lot of risk, you are impatient. This is, what, this is the constraint you face. Okay? All right, For, uh, from the technical point of view, of course, this is, um, as I said, this is a PD and we need to solve it. But just cranking numbers and getting a solution and a method and that, that, in quantitative finance is not going to take us far. Unless we understand the hidden intuition of this, then we cannot really uh, solve the problem and push the direction further. And there is an index that uh, turns out to capture a lot of uh, intuition in our model. And you will see in, in f 10 minutes or so. How much minutes do I have, by the way? I lost track. Maybe 20. 20, fine. In 19 minutes. You will see that when the, when the investor comes to, to, goes to the manager, the investor is not going to say, this is my you, right? This is my little you. No one knows my little you. But you can say, how much risk are you willing to tolerate? You can say, you know, I don't want the, the variance to go below that with some probability. I want to have this return. And in a sense, what you actually convey to the manager is this index. And mathematically, it turns out to be the correct quantity uh, that uh, we, we have to examine. And this is um, known as the risk tolerance. OK. So if you, uh, if you go back to the PD that I, the, that I gave you for the utility and you use this transformation, you get an object that is very familiar to mathematicians who do PDEs or, and to physicists. This is um, the well-known transport equation. In a sense, what this tells you is that if you know the way you feel towards the risk you want to undertake, your utility or your performance is constant along curves that have uh, this, uh, the slope equal to the, characteristic, to the risk tolerance. What does this mean? In a sense, it tells me, give me how you feel today. This is the initial datum, you not. And give me the way you, the, the way, describe to me uh, how much risk you are willing to undertake? Then there's a beautiful theory, the theory of characteristics for first order PDs, that tells you that I can start with your initial performance, utility, target, you name it. You give me your risk profile, and then I can generate gradually, I can, uh, I can um, produce these curves and give you the utility. Uh, surface. Remember the utility surface was this um, uh, surface that I had to the right of the screen when I was trying to put together the different things in order to find the solution. And then there is a little bit more and uh, as someone who works in differential equations I found a lot of pleasure in discovering something that I talked with some physicists and there is a lot of substance between uh, these uh, risk problems and uh, problems that have to do with material science, as you're going to see in a minute. So, so far, I have a variational constraint that uh, tells me you cannot have everything in life. There is um, this index that uh, ca will come into the discussion between the manager and the client. And it turns out that uh, this index solves uh, a very well-known equation, which is what is called a fast diffusion equation. For those of you uh, who know, um, you know, if you, if you eliminate the thing that you see this little uh, palm here, then what you get is nothing else than the famous heat equation, which basically tells you how uh, heat is, con is transmitted in uh, a certain medium. <coughs> and the fast diffusion equation basically tells you that 
you have a diffusion equation that is fast, as the name says, which means that you have propagation at much higher speed than the infinite speed for the heat conduction. Then, now comes a, a something else that uh, I find very intriguing. In, um, in utility uh, theory, there is, as I said, the risk tolerance that is also a very important index in decision analysis. And the reciprocal of it is the risk aversion. And there, there are th reasons why we should be using risk tolerance due to units and all kinds of nice things, and why we should be using also the risk aversion, that coefficient. If you do maybe a few pages of calculations, you find that the risk aversion solves another very famous PD, which is what is known as the porous medium equation. The porous medium equation is an equation that gives you the, the density of a gas that is propagated into a porous medium. And of course, when you have the heat conduction, the speed is infinite, but when you have the, the, the gas propagation, the speed is finite. And in a sense, we see these two phenomena between the risk tolerance and the risk aversion that is the reciprocal of risk tolerance. So, you can see that uh, in order to to understand a very simple, just one piece of the puzzle in this performance problem that I examine, how much uh, PD theory comes into, is needed, okay? Just to understand a little bit of the big picture. Now, I have to look at my environment, which is the stochastic, the, the market input, okay? I'm done with the way I feel. In a sense, I found uh, conditions and problems that I need to solve in order to construct my what I call variational input. So where am I? Where am I finding myself? Okay, so um, we can think about the opportunities that we have because it doesn't really matter how I feel. If there's nothing I can do, I should leave. Um, I will find myself in a market environment that securities can be traded. And of course, securities are priced by equilibrium conditions, so the prices are already given to me. And this is uh, a very reasonable and a very rich uh, class of models. And these are uh, ITO processes that we use widely in mathematical finance. So just think that I have uh, N securities and I have uh, a very precise description about the evolution of their price of their price all right so these are now some uh, things that uh, we discovered and it took uh, quite a while to understand how to put all the pieces of the puzzle together so the first line is something that we assume in our models that we can find this process lambda that is uh, what we call the, the market price of risk. So this is given. As I mentioned earlier, I might want to track my performance in terms of something else. And this is what we call a benchmark. So I will assume that I have such a process. Now I have something else and this was uh, quite of a surprise to us. As I said, you can be the investor and go to a, client, to, to a manager and say, this is what I want to do in that market, but you might have different views of how the returns, will, the returns in this market will be. And this is what this process uh, will do for you. And this is now way too technical, but just to share with you my pain, it took us more than six months to understand that there is no way you can solve this problem if you think about time in the conventional way. It is just out of the question. The time is not the calendar time, today, tomorrow, and so on. You have to subordinate time in a way that makes a lot of sense. And in a sense, now it's, it's clear. In a sense, what you do here is like having 
a, a, a tank full of risk fuel and every day you invest, every day you look at your performance, you eat up a little bit of it, a little bit of it, a little bit of it, and eventually this is what will determine what we call in markets the risk budget. Okay, so now I'm coming close to the solution. How do we put everything together? As I said, this is me. I don't feel that way personally, but this is the investor, okay? And this is, uh, this is the market. And in order to solve that problem, I had to invent the way my utility is trans transported, the way my risk tolerance behaves, and what I should add to the market. You see, the market initially is the lambda and the sigma, things that are given to me. And I had to invent, the, the benchmark is also given to me, but I might have different views and I need to quantify them and then I have to determine my time coordinate appropriately. And then we put everything together and under very minimal model assumptions, we came up with this solution. In a sense, this is the optimal performance and I really don't want to tire you with, with formulas. All I want to convey is how we put together the environment, our feelings, all this uh, technical work to come up with a solution. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, the optimal performance is not that important. Wh how I go about it is what matters in practice. So what is my optimal portfolio? My optimal portfolio has a wonderful structure. It turns out to be a linear combination of my wealth, and my risk tolerance. And actually this came as a real surprise to us. What I have and what I can tolerate. And everything out of this very difficult problem and minimal model assumptions and time changes and all kinds of stochastic calculus and PDs and this and this and this, something very neat came out. And you can actually see it. It's right here. And please don't worry about the, the different things. All you care about is the market, my benchmark, my wealth, my views, my risk tolerance, and that's the end of it. So how, what have we accomplished so far? In a sense, if we look at the last line, all it matters in order to answer these questions is the wealth, and the risk tolerance, how much risk I tolerate and how much wealth I have. And a little bit more for those of you in the audience with mathematical uh, you know, taste, we can push this analysis to the limit because in a sense, I come up with a stochastic system. I can solve the system after changing time and using Levy's theorem and so and so and so and so. And we can deduce something very simple but extremely difficult to solve, at least in my knowledge. It has a very nice structure and in a sense we can solve the problem explicitly and analytically. And you can ask the question, so what? Okay, now comes the reality. How about if I have no benchmark and no views. What does it mean I have no views? I agree with you. If the manager tells me that the market will perform lambda, I say yes, okay, I agree. Let's go ahead and see what I can do. Um, if having no benchmark, in a sense, it means that um, I use as a numerator the discounted bond. That's a, possi that's a possible scenario. Then. I have the optimal allocation right here. I look at, I solve, I look at the way I feel today, I solve the PD, I have my risk fuel, I find my portfolio, and I'm done. Now comes what Peter was talking about. In a sense, as I said, in derivatives, we kill the risk. So, in some sense, a derivative business should be a subset of the performance business, 
right? And in a sense, if you formulate it from this point of view, you can see that if you try to kill the risk, what does it mean to kill the risk? Assuming that you have a very simple benchmark. Killing the risk, it means you go against the lambda, the uncertainty, and you, you, you have your views equal to minus lambda, and you kill it. Then when you go back to the solutions that we produced, we can see that the optimal portfolio, this is what you put in the risky asset, is zero. And this is what the derivatives industry does. It kills the zero, I mean, it kills the risk, and this is like following a riskless strategy. So we see that what we do in derivatives, at least in theory, is a special case of what we should be doing in investments. Okay? Then I can manipulate all kinds of things. I can play with my views, my benchmark, my here and here, and I can produce even uh, policies that uh, are very counterintuitive. Put nothing in the riskless asset, which at least in theory is, uh, is very much contrary to the intuition. But in a sense, this, this happens. So what have we done so far, at least in, in, in our offices? Okay. So in a sense, I first look at where I find myself, my investment universe, which demands to come up with stochastic processes that describe the prices of assets, right? Then the investor comes in and says, this is my risk tolerance. This is how much risk I want to undertake. Then I can ask myself, do you want to follow a benchmark? Yes, no. Do you have certain views? Do you have certain constraints? Then I solve how it's a different story. But then I solve uh, the fast diffusion equation that gives me the risk tolerance. Then I can use the mathematical technique to discover, to uh, produce my, the variational input. Then I can find my optimal performance, and then I can find my portfolio. And of course, so far we use stochastic calculus, PDEs, equilibrium theory, stochastic control, and we came up with a very simple answer, simple in sense of structure, that tells you that if you do all this, then you can answer the question, what is the optimal allocation? So this is what we would do at the academic level. What would we, what would we do in practice? So here I have someone, an investor, and goes to a manager and says, this is what I would like to generate. This is, what, this is how I would like my wealth to be in the future. So in a sense, I will give my wish list about the future wealth distribution, right? I will, about that time, my wealth, I want to be so-and-so with some probability, so-and-so with some other probability, and so on. This is what I will tell you to the manager. All right, now comes the second and the third step that are extremely challenging. And there's a very recent uh, beautiful work of William Sharp that tells you that by looking at what the investor wants, you can infer his future risk tolerance. And so far, Sharp has given an example in a, sing a simple, a single period, or, uh, in a simple model structure, and we are trying to uh, generalize it. So I tell you what I would like to generate, and from there, you, the manager, will infer my risk tolerance. Now, I will go back to my office, solve the fast diffusion equation, and construct the risk tolerance. I will also incorporate the benchmark, the views, the constraints. I will construct the target process, the theory is there. I will construct the optimal portfolio. And from this step down to this step is all mathematical research. And then the manager 
will tell to the investor, if this is what you want to achieve, this is how much it will cost you, and this is what I will do for you. And hopefully they will like each other and they will continue their collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just, this is what I wanted to share with you. It's, uh, it's a long journey between, uh, you know, to go from point A to point B. But this is, uh, in, in many ways, what investment practice uh, is all about. And how we achieve these things uh, is, you know, the task of uh, quantitative finance. Okay, thank you very much. I want to cover just a, a couple of things here. I know I'm standing between you and the food at this point. And I promised uh, Jean-Pierre that uh, I would do two things. One is mention the uh, oxymoronic concept of a not-for-profit hedge fund, which I think is an idea worth exploring. And the second is to try to keep you awake whilst uh, talking about synthetic collateralized bond obligations, which I'm sure to many of you sounds about as exciting as doing your tax returns. Um, however, I hope uh, you'll see some perspective on this. This is a, a game like any other. And I think that we've only just begun to, um, to utilize uh, the collection of various techniques which you know, quants might use. And I, I applaud the uh, interdisciplinary approach here. Um, I think that a combination of statistics and mathematics and computer science and all sorts of other fields um, can really have a big <coughs> impact. We tried to do that at Morgan Stanley with, with some success. Um, and uh, subsequent to that, some of the consultants on that project have made uh, really big strides towards trying to replicate something that might be better than that. And a lot of us have thought about the question of whether there's something that needs to be done sort of halfway in between industry and, uh, and academia. Uh, I believe we had a, a faithful dinner one night and uh, the idea of setting up a not-for-profit hedge fund, in other words, a hedge fund set up to raise money for charity, uh, leveraging pro bono contributions from people skilled in uh, various different fields. Um, and uh, of course, Jean-Pierre, being a mathematician, thought this was a brilliant idea immediately. Uh, I don't know what went through his head, um, other than the two glasses of wine, but um, there are actually a lot of very obvious things. Um, I don't want to sound like a sort of a $7 uh, you know, business book or something, but uh, there are obvious synergies between sophisticated ways of making money in the market and tools which are needed for academic research, for policy recommendations and for all sorts of other things. All this is very obvious to academics, so I'm preaching to the, the choir here, uh, but not so obvious uh, in industry. Um, another thing that's perhaps not obvious is that um, in order for those things to be really monetarily significant, it requires cooperation from people who are deeply embedded um, in this business. And on the other hand, to get to that point requires uh, uh, giving up a lot of the skills <laughs> that you might previously have had to solve those problems. Uh, very few people, Peter Carr is one of them, have managed to sort of keep that balance. Um, there are many other obvious things one could say um, along these lines. And uh, perhaps one of them is, is the uh, obvious individual and incremental incentives, both in academia and in industry. Certainly in mathematical finance, we've never really taken the kind of team approach that you see in physics and other fields. And we've never really tried to isolate um, really important monetary problems which are non-trivial and which can be uh, rapidly turned into uh, tools. Um, that was a crazy idea, but then I found myself down the end of State Street. Uh, I notice you have a gap here. I know you've been trying to keep them out of Santa Barbara, perhaps, but there is one. Uh, and they have this red product now. You know, you can buy red stuff. And, uh, some percentage of the money presumably goes to Africa. Um, this apparently dovetails well and completely coincidentally with uh, red pie, which is an um, uh, organization yet to exist. Um, what exactly this will be, some consortium, some research consortium or whatever. Uh, stands for research, education, development, and development, sorry, in the public interest. And I swear to you that on one of those gap ads, I think it was in the Washington Post, there's a supermodel wearing a shirt. and. Uh, it's folded in such a way that it actually reads pie red. So that's getting pretty close to uh, mainstream and perhaps um, actually happening. But I hope that uh, one way or another, it's possible to create a situation where people can actually leverage their specific skills uh, to do something uh, very worthwhile. 
and to take advantage of the synergies between not just making money for charities but also using that knowledge to create tools um, to benefit the uh, now increasing uh, kind of social finance sector. I add, of course, there's nothing original about the idea of a, a, a not-for-profit hedge fund. They already exist, although some of them perhaps for dubious uh, reasons. And, of course, a non-profit hedge fund is becoming a ubiquitous concept. Um, that's not what I'm talking about either. Um, I want to talk about a game, but I realize that the game I want to talk about is not terribly familiar to you, so I'll start with something a, a little more um, uh, well-known. Uh, this position uh, is uh, tragic on various levels. Um, it's from a chess movie, a genre which is perhaps tragic in itself. And if you know of that, you know that the uh, troubled genius Alexander Luzin is up against uh, the grandmaster in the final of uh, a chess tournament somewhere in Europe, I forget where. And as you can see, a simple linear model applied to this position would suggest that uh, despite the complications which led to this uh, situation, he is entirely lost. It is perhaps for that reason that he hurls himself out of a second story window to his death, although other factors may have come into that. Um, but of course I don't want to talk about this chess position or what happens. Perhaps there's someone can see what's going to uh, unfold here. Um, what I want to talk about just briefly is uh, chess as an example of quantitative and interdisciplinary approaches uh, being applied to uh, solve something. But it was hard, 30 years or so of algorithmic research to uh, finally reach a level where not only can uh, computers uh, beat humans, but uh, chess uh, computers can create games which are indistinguishable from human games as judged by an expert. It's actually there's a chess version of the Turing test that I think Gary Kasparov actually failed. Uh, it doesn't mean Gary Kasparov is a computer, it means that that uh, he was not able to distinguish between uh, human games and computer games. And that's saying something. Now, the, tra the real tragedy of this, of course, um, is it in its current analogy, I think, to finance. And I don't want to sound negative about this. It's actually a very positive thing. Um, but the situation right now is, hello, I'm a trader. Um, I'm a genius. Can you work out some formulas for me? Oh, I made a mistake the other week. I blundered my queen. Can you write something that prevents me from blundering my queen? Um, okay, I'll do that sort of thing. Uh, the trader doesn't ask for something to replace him. Um, and to some sense, we're uh, perhaps a long way away from that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's difficult to make uh, huge volumes of money playing chess. Uh, it's uh, quite dangerous too. I, was in, I found that out the other week. I was in Washington Square Park. And <laughs> some guy pulled out a knife about this long, <laughs> two tables away from me. So I want to show you a game where you can actually make a lot of money without uh, exposing yourself to risk, <laughs> and uh, at least of the physical kind. Um, and it's uh, collateralized debt obligation. I thought, oh no, how am I going to explain collateralized debt obligations? And then I realized this is ridiculous. Um, you already know what they are. Those of you who actually studied corporate finance, and I didn't, would have a better idea than me. Um, so let's uh, flash forward to the future a little bit, where the, uh, the Google computers have become self-aware and have decided creating companies for themselves. The game I'm talking about, of course, is capitalism. And, uh, of course, techniques could be applied to uh, figure out the perfect company to create uh, that makes the most amount of money. I want to simplify that problem considerably here um, with an important assumption, and that is that the company you want to create can't do anything. On day, on day one, I'm going to take an investor's money and I'm going to put it in a box and my business plan says we will not do anything for five years and after five years we will liquidate the company. Um, well, what do you do with the money? Of course you go out and buy bonds from other companies and you put them in the box and at the end of five years uh, presumably there's a bit more money in the box coming from the uh, interest on those bonds and the investors take their money back and everyone's happy. And no, one, no one bothers to notice that you never had a business plan to begin with. Well, it's a slight simplification. Um, and you can add a bit of a twist here by, of course, using the same tricks used for regular companies and introducing subordination. So, you have different classes of investors. The senior debt holders, of course, turn up to look at the box first and they say, I own 70 of those 100 bonds in this box. Thank you very much. I'm going to go through and pick the best ones um, that are there. What are the best bonds? Presumably not uh, WorldCom, Global, Global Crossing and the rest of them, but those are still in good, still in good stead. 
Again, this is a slight simplification of the, the structure of this company, but it's essentially what's going on. The uh, equity holders, of course, are last to arrive at my box, which has opened after five years. And uh, if there have been no corporate defaults out of that uh, basket of securities I bought, um, then they'll be the happiest of all, because they're obviously the first on the hook for any losses that occur. Um, so that's the game thought of it in a different way. We simply have a portfolio of bonds, and we look at the aggregate losses in that portfolio, and uh, you can choose which class of investor you want to be. Uh, the further down in subordination you are, the uh, greater uh, the payments to you in compensation for your um, increased risk. In this example, uh, we've shown a, uh, a, a company where, let's say, the AAA tranche holder, um, sorry for the jargon, is uh, on the hook after 22% of losses have occurred in the portfolio. Well, that's probably not going to happen in investment-grade credit. You see a lot of things in the newspaper, but these things really don't default that often. Um, so he's pretty safe. Um, <laughs> And of course he doesn't get compensated. Uh, this guy's sitting on the beach here um, and uh, is looking uh, pretty pleased with himself. There's almost uh, no chance he's going to suffer any losses. On the other hand, he's not been compensated that well and it appears to have already squandered it on his uh, strawberry daiquiri or whatever that is. The guy in the middle um, is a 3 through 7% tranche investor. Uh, there is some chance, as you can see, that uh, the rising tide of corporate defaults will uh, raise his uh, position, and he's been compensated. But the equity tranche holder um, takes on the most risk, and as you can see, he's got a large uh, pile of money to compensate him for this. That's the game. How much should he be compensated? Uh, what is the likelihood of uh, defaults occurring? Uh, it's not clear if he's uh, waving or drowning there, but he's certainly well compensated. And this game is a big one. The uh, companies I speak of are, are in the uh, orange column here, and this market continues to grow. The numbers are in uh, billions. Setting up an actual company like this is expensive. There are derivative versions of the same thing, and they are the green columns, and they are becoming even more popular. So that's a, a big market, and that's a big game, but uh, that's only the first uh, part of the game when you actually set up the company. Um, standardized versions of these companies trade and they have different maturities and uh, different reference portfolios uh, which may be overlapping with other ones so there's a, a very intriguing uh, combinatorial uh, um, modeling uh, issue to deal with and here we are at the top of the sort of triangle of different ways of getting long US corporate credit uh, the simplest way of course is simply to uh, gain exposure to any particular company. Um, you could go out and buy an Amazon bond, for example, and your coupon would, of course, be a lot higher than just putting it in the bank. Uh, but if Amazon defaults, you may be in trouble. There are synthetic ways of doing the same thing, or derivative versions, um, called credit default swaps down the bottom. And that's exactly analogous to car insurance. It's just I'm insuring a bond. Um, I don't have a car, so I'm going to insure someone else's car instead, in this case. And uh, I pay a running premium every year, and if anything happens to the bond, in other words, the company decides to stop paying coupons, then I will get compensated for the losses. And how that works is they just put a, a, a number on what the bond is worth, say 100, and if something happens, then uh, I get 100, but I have to give up the bond. A um, bit like car insurance, you total your car, you give up the wrecked car, but you get the face value back again. In this case, I might not own the car, so I might have to go out and buy the car from you in order to be compensated, and that creates some interesting situations in the market sometimes. Um, but from these, sim from these simple uh, contracts applied to individual companies, you can back out the probability going forward in time that any particular corporate uh, is going to decide to default on its obligations. Um, that's a, a sufficiently liquid market, so we know 5 years, 2%, 7 years, 10%, whatever. So you say, well, that's simple now. I know how to value my, my box of 100 companies, even with a subordinated structure, right? I just go and you know, have a model for each company and, uh, and simulate or find some way to solve it. But it, life is not so simple because uh, corporate defaults are, of course, correlated. And the dependent structure between the uh, one company deciding to default and another 
is something which we will almost certainly never figure out. Um, so we, uh, we do something. Uh, there are many reasons why they're, they're correlated. Some obvious ones, interest rates, macroeconomic factors, uh, management practices, who knows, uh, the Fed. <laughs> um, there, there would appear to be um, uh, some credit cycles um, and uh, whatever you think of uh, correlation, whether it's real or not, and there's a bit of a debate in academia about how big it should be, the market certainly prices it in. This is the only sort of numbers I'll, I'll, I'll try to show here. Um, I apologize for showing you something that looks like it's come off a Bloomberg screen. Um, but for example, uh, do I have a mouse? I don't. Um, here's our, our fellow sitting in the sandcastle on the beach with some subordination. He's been compensated roughly 2% over and above the risk-free rate in order for the, the, uh, the risk he's taking, according to a model where there's zero correlation between the companies which might default. On the other hand, uh, the market says something different, and the further up you go, of course, the, the, the greater the disparity between a simple uh, independent model and the market prices. The difference over here is the job of the quant to try to explain and also to try to interpolate uh, how these numbers should change as you change maturity, as you change attachment points, subordination. As, if you take some names out of the portfolio and put other ones back in, you have a, a glorified uh, interpolation problem here at time zero to solve. Um, and uh, it's not a problem for which any satisfactory solution is at least well circulated. Um, now, of course, do you want uh, to understand why correlation is so important, why we talk about, the, about all these products as correlation products? Uh, it's because it makes a huge material impact on, on the, uh, the price of the security. Uh, do I want high correlation or low correlation as an investor? Well, if I'm the equity holder in one of these companies, then I'm only going to survive if there are no defaults. Um, so in the ordinary course of events, there'll probably, on average, be more than that. So I really want to have a high correlated world. Or if you, prefer, or if you like, uh, I'm walking through a minefield and I uh, have no protection. And I get hit as soon as I step on a mine. So do I want a world in which the mines are evenly distributed, defaults are uncorrelated, or do, do I want a world in which they cluster uh, together? Of course I want a world in which they cluster, because then I've got a fighting chance. The senior tranche holder, on the other hand, um, is safe unless there is well above the average number of defaults occurring. So a senior investor is like the gentleman here with the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the sort of platform shoes or something, who can safely walk across a minefield and, and suffer you know, up to four uh, impacts. So if in a high correlated world, he might get blown up. Um, in a low correlated world, uh, he's probably going to be fine. So that's what he wants because it's not clear whether these shoes are going to survive the minefield, and that's why there's three pages of disclosures at the end of this, uh, <laughs> this talk. But the, the intuition is simple. Um, high correlation is good for some investors and bad for others. And uh, the market implied correlation, it's just like a market implied uh, volatility in some sense, what it gets traded. Uh, and uh, a million examples of why correlation um, should occur, both real correlation and defaults and uh, price correlation. Imagine, for example, the market suddenly decides that pension and labor costs uh, to companies is now a really bi a big deal. They probably think the same way about a number of different companies, and that would affect the probability, or at least the market implied probability, of all of those collectively defaulting. Uh, that's not a real correlation in the world, but it's still important. So. Uh, this is certainly one area where there are, we'll be <laughs> trying to solve the math for, for decades to come. Uh, even in a very simple misspecified model, which nobody um, um, really defends. I, I was talking with David Lee recently, and, um, and uh, he certainly doesn't think highly of the model. Um, and no one else does. But even in the simple misspecified model, you've got a large number of parameters because you really need to model the correlation between every pair of companies. That's, that's absolutely hopeless. Of course, you could replace the point estimate of your correlation matrix with you know, some uh, Bayesian thing or whatever, but um, there's clearly some parameters here. A bigger problem with this model 
is that it's not set up to provide uh, a forward-looking view of what's going to happen um, in the market. Uh, you can apply the copula framework takes uh, default times as being given and then wax the copula on them. But the theory of copulas applied to st stochastic processes, which is what you really need here, is still being worked out. In the meantime, we take things, um, we treat these uh, things which should be processes as uh, random variables. And sure, you can try to move the car forward uh, by doing the appropriate Bayesian computations and so forth, which I won't go into. But the truth of the matter is, after time zero, the gearbox kind of falls out on the floor, and no one believes the dynamic implications of these models. Uh, no one believes you can find the parameters to get them right in the first place. Um, but certainly, this is not the sort of thing. And so, of a more academic bent, uh, models where you directly estimate the probability of something defaulting um, in a given instant are popular, um, and and you sort of ascribe the uh, the dependence in companies defaulting to co-movements in their probabilities of defaulting alone. Unfortunately, um, you'd have to have some pretty dramatic uh, co-movements in uh, default correlation to bring about things like uh, delta and northwest defaulting within three minutes of each other, um, or even to match market prices for some of the more liquid uh, companies which are traded on the market. Now, actually, Jean-Pierre has made um, great progress in, in this particular um, uh, area by showing that analytics, uh, new analytic solutions and, and singular perturbations can be applied to find uh, tractable ways of dealing with processes which are much less benign than most of the regular stochastic processes we use in finance. Um, for example, you know, there's, there's plenty of things you can take off the shelf, uh, the affine family, uh, for example, um, but they don't seem to accurately or at least I, I think resemble um, what is really going on in, in reality. These are small probability events. I mean, how do you model the dynamics of a small probability event? It's not going to be a, a nice process. Uh, you know, I use one example. I say, you know, you take out a piece of paper and, and try to sort of model it in time the instantaneous probability that you're so bored with my talk you walk out the door. Right? That's, if you think about it, that's, it's very difficult to, um, it's very unlikely that that kind of process um, is going to be uh, terribly uh, amenable to mathematical uh, um, approaches, at least simple ones. So uh, an open problem, which I'm sure will be an open problem for a very long time, is to build a dynamic credit model for hundreds of assets, um, which is consistent across sub-portfolios. By that I mean that, you know, if you have uh, 100 names and 50 of them overlap with another portfolio, then everything is internally consistent. That's hard to do. Most of the progress here has been made by simplifying to single portfolio problems, um, which is internally consistent, has computable dynamics. That's very tough because you typically need Monte Carlo for a lot of these um, pricing exercises, and that's hopelessly slow, as I'll show you in a second, for, for some applications. Um, it must be tractable. It must price the, uh, what you want to look at, and it must be calibrated to the market. Very, very difficult problem. Um, to give you an example of why this is so difficult, there are some companies, I explained a very simple one, but you can have cash flow triggers and coverage tests and all the rest of it, which make things more complicated. And they take, let's say, one second to compute for one path. So if you're doing a one Monte Carlo valuation, it would take one second multiplied by, let's say, 10,000 paths to compute the valuation. Now, let's say we're doing an estimation with a completely mainstream approach of you know, simulated method of moments or efficient method of moments. You want to generate paths of these products forward in time. You want to price them at each point, and then you want to search in some parameter space. Completely reasonable thing to do. Do the back of the envelope calculation, and you'll be here for a while. So, of course, you wouldn't do it that way, but there's things to be done, and uh, there's no end to the, uh, the leverage can, that can be obtained, I think, by advances in this sort of computational uh, um, aspect. And you would need this for a whole bunch of other things, too, if you ever want to get closer to the point where you're not just, um, you know, the, the, the blunder checker, um, and you're actually starting to have a material impact on how the companies uh, are formed or which uh, reference assets go into them, how they're dynamically hedged in time, 
um, and so on and so forth. And uh, because of changes in this, the market now, this is becoming uh, even more important. Uh, people are interested in rating stability now. It never used to be. So now you want to simulate forward in time your companies and, uh, and see what's going to happen to their ratings. That, that's a very computationally difficult thing to do, especially if you don't have a consistent framework to begin with. Um, there are new versions of uh, these simple companies which don't exist for five years or seven years. They exist indefinitely. And the rating agencies are very worried about them and require very stringent tests on um, the interest rate, forex, uh, ratings migration, and all sorts of other exposures, and those are becoming um, very difficult to model. Uh, and if that becomes the constraint now in your sort of global optimization problem, which company do I create, um, then this is a, a very serious uh, problem as well. And of course, as desks uh, try to become more uh, quantitative about how they, they monetize uh, trades, how they look at contingent hedging costs, um, and so on and so forth, um, there will be many interesting problems uh, that come up. And, uh, and again, it all comes back to the simple fact that right now we're struggling just to do half-decent interpolations at time zero across a range of financial products. And what we need to be able to do is drive the car forward and, uh, and see what's going to happen. Um, and uh, if you can't do that, then you're forever stuck in this situation where the simple model you build is, uh, is not really going to tell you what's going to happen. I think if you took uh, you know, a group of uh, quants from Wall Street and you said you've got six months to write a computer program that plays chess, um, and then, well, you get something that maybe could beat a novice, but maybe not. And uh, if you said, well, okay, let's run that program for as long as it takes until you reach sort of a grandmaster level, um, then I think that's an interesting thought experiment in terms of where we are with quantitative finance. Uh, I actually asked this question to a number of computer science and, and, and chess experts, and the typical answer is somewhere between a, a million or, or a billion in terms of a speed increase, which represents some sort of equivalent measure in algorithmic terms of how far we've come with at least this problem. Um, so the things I've talked about are, of course, hopelessly intractable right now, uh, but in some sense, they're just a matter of uh, aggregating tricks um, you know, from, uh, from different fields and uh, finding the right dodgy approximations and, and getting something done. Um, so I hope that uh, one way or another, um, we're going to be able to uh, raise the bar um, and, uh, and, and not so much just uh, augment the human decision making and provide kind of uh, requisite formulas for, um, for finance, but actually uh, get to the point where we can really sort of challenge the, the, uh, the human decision making in some of these very simplified uh, uh, structured finance situations. Yeah. And for those interested in computational finance, you've probably seen the, uh, the peanut butter analogy before. Um, perhaps I'll end with that. Uh, when you say you want to you know, speed things up by a factor of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 9, people go, well, why bother? Uh, it's kind of like reducing the price of peanut butter by a factor of 10 to the 6. Like, OK, my sandwiches are cheaper now, or, or free, but so what? But the truth of the matter is you, you start finding more and more applications. You start realizing that peanut butter is a substitute for other foods. And soon, you know, then it becomes cheap enough to use as heating oil or whatever. And, and then you start paving your roads with it, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Um, so I, I think this is, this is where this is going to go with computational finance, uh, but I've been wrong about other things, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you.